Welcome to chapter 15 of the Canadian Securities Course, volume 2. In this chapter, we are going to be going over an intro to the portfolio approach. So, starting off this chapter, we are going to be talking about rate of return. It is a really important concept to understand for the entire chapter. Um, so basically rate of return, it can be calculated two different ways. The first being ex ante return, meaning expected return. And then the second way being ex post re return, meaning the actual historic return that that security may have had. Now, ex ante can be calculated as the expected cash flow, meaning dividends for the most part, um, plus the expected capital gain divided by the beginning value. So that is how you will get the expected return, especially for common shares. If you're looking at bonds, then it might be, um, for example, the interest gained on the bond and then also that expected capital gain divided by the uh, beginning value of that bond that you bought, bought it for. Now, ex post, it can be calculated a bit differently. Um, it is basically... Uh, the ending value, subtract the beginning value, divided by the beginning value again. So you'll be able to get a percentage off of that, and that will be your ex post return or the historical return. Now, another important concept that goes along with rate of return is understanding the risk and return relationship. So basically, securities or investments that offer lower risk have lower expected returns as well and securities with higher risks have higher expected returns so this essentially means that if you are a long-term investor chasing the highest possible returns you would want to invest in common shares since they have the higher x anti return now for uh, a regular portfolio when you are building it of course you don't want to put all of your money in one area you do want to be diversified um, but uh, the common shares will tend to give you the highest expected return, but they are also the riskiest and they will fluctuate the most as well. So next we are going to be looking at some different types of risks. The first one being inflation rate risk. So this is the risk that inflation will reduce future purchasing power and the real return on investments. So this is really high if you're holding cash because obviously cash, it doesn't really grow. You will have it in a savings account. It might have 0.1% return on it, but inflation, it tends to be around 2%. So basically the value of the money, the purchasing power of your money is decreasing over time because it isn't keeping up with inflation. Now the same can be said if you have, um, if you're invested in the stock market, and let's say you're getting a 7% return. If the inflation is 2%, then your real rate of return would only be uh, 5%. So basically, there is always inflation rate risk, no matter what. Business risk, it is a bit better. Uh, business risk, it is a bit different. Um, this is the uncertainty regarding a company's future performance. So obviously this is high when you are investing in a specific security or a specific stock um, because that uh, price of that stock relies heavily on the business. Political risk is the risk of unfavorable changes in government policies. This is a big one, especially in China with companies like uh, Alibaba. Um, Political risk is huge there. The Chinese government, they can change restrictions um, whenever they want, basically. So for all Chinese companies, there is high political risk. Um, liquidity risk, this is the risk that an investor will not be able to buy or sell a security at a fair price quickly enough because buying and selling opportunities are limited. So this doesn't happen um, on the stock market often because the stock market is quite liquid. But for things like uh, the OTC market, um, that might be a little bit um, more illiquid. And so some other risks include interest rate risk. This is the risk that changing interest rates will adversely affect 
an investment. This is high in the bond market because, of course, the price of bonds, they're inversely related with interest rates, meaning that if interest rates increase, bond prices tend to decrease. Um, now, if in interest rates do decrease, this tends to help bonds if you already do have them um, because the price of those bonds will increase, so you could actually sell them for a capital gain there. Foreign investment risk, this is the risk of loss resulting from an unfavorable change in exchange rates. Exchange rates, they... Uh, foreign investment risk is the risk of loss resulting from an unfavorable change in exchange rates. Now, exchange rates, they do tend to play a larger factor in commodities um, just because there's a lot of importing and exporting. Um, so there would be higher foreign investment risk there. Default risk is the risk that a company will be unable to make timely interest payments or repay loans. And if you guys remember back to last chapter, we talked a lot about um, risk uh, ratios, which included the debt to equity ratio. So having s sort of high debt or uh, maybe high uh, and in high interest coverage ratio, meaning you can't really pay off um, your debt that efficiently, um, that would result in a higher default risk, meaning the company could go bankrupt um, more easily. Systematic risk, this is the risk associated with investing in each capital market. It's also just the market risk. Um, so uh, this is a really important one to differentiate against uh, non-systemic risk. Um, so the, the non-systematic risk, this is the risk that the price of a specific security or a specific group of securities will change in price. Um, now, so the difference there is that the systematic risk, this is the whole market risk. Um, basically, it's the broader factors affecting it, the macroeconomic factors, whereas the non-systematic risk is more the individual factors for that specific company or the specific industry or whatnot. And here is a really useful graph to sort of um, push through that point of systematic risk versus unsystematic risk. Um, so basically the total risk is equal to the unsystematic risk plus the systematic risk. Um, and that unsystematic risk or specific risk, it is specific to the individual companies. So you can actually decrease this risk by purchasing more companies. That's why diversification is really helpful and it will lower the risk of your portfolio um, because the more stocks you have, sort of the less um, volatile your portfolio will be um, from a change in one or two of those individual stocks or maybe um, one or two uh, individual industries. Um, whereas the systematic risk or market risk, it cannot be removed. Um, basically, it's that risk that will affect the market as a whole. So even if your portfolio is diversified, um, you cannot get rid of that systematic risk. There are also a few other ways you can measure risk. Um, one of these being standard deviation. This is used to determine a range of possible future outcomes and the more volatile a stock is, the larger the range will be. Um, and of course, it does use past performance to calculate it. And so next, we are going to be looking at beta. And beta links the risk of individual securities or a portfolio to the market as a whole. The higher the beta is, the greater the risk. So for example, if you do have a beta of one, and let's say the market increases by 10%, um, based on that beta, um, your portfolio with the beta of one will increase by 10% as well. If the beta is two, then basically that means that if the market increases by 10%, your portfolio will theoretically increase by 20%. Um, and the same if it's 0.5, it'll increase by 5%. So beta, it really does link that risk to the market and it will link it to um, the market returns. So if you do have a higher beta, it is more volatile, um, but you will basically amplify the returns of the market. Now alpha, alpha means the excess returns earned on the portfolio. Um, so if you do have, um, let's say a return of 10%, 
um, and the market was 8%, your alpha would be 2%. And this is often credited to the skill of the advisor or fund manager, um, whoever is managing that portfolio. Now, next, we're going to be going over two portfolio manager styles. One, you have active management, and this has the goal uh, to outperform a benchmark portfolio on a risk-adjusted basis. So a lot of mutual funds, they would be active, actively managed. Um, basically, they're buying and selling stocks, looking to outperform um, the market. Um, whereas passive management just uh, tends to replicate the performance of a specific market index without trying to beat it. And a lot of these are, for example, ETFs, which we will go into later, um, where they will try to replicate the um, certain indexes and the stocks that are weighted within that index so they can replicate that performance. Now, within active management, there is two different types. You have your top-down analysis, which begins with a study of broad macroeconomic factors before you do narrow to the individual stocks. And on the opposite side of things, you have bottom-up analysis. And this is where the focus is on individual stocks. And the portfolio manager looks at these characteristics of the various stocks and builds a portfolio based on the stocks that they think will perform the best. Now, passive management, on the other hand, has two strategies as well. It has the buy and hold strategy, which is consistent with the view that markets are efficient and that securities are priced correctly. So basically, if you buy a stock now and hold it, um, over time, you will make money on it. And that is that passive management buy and hold strategy. Um, the other strategy is indexing. So buying and holding a portfolio of securities that matches the composi composition of a benchmark index is also a passive management strategy. And it's what ETFs use. Um, and we will go into further depth in that chapter where we talk all about ETFs. Now, there are some equity manager styles. These are more towards um, active management um, styles. It's um, obviously the growth style and the value style. So growth managers, um, they focus on the current and future earnings of an individual company, and they specifically look at earnings per share. Now, growth managers, they look for earnings momentum and will pay more for a company if they feel its growth potential warrants a higher stock price. So essentially, growth managers are basically looking for stocks with high growth and earnings momentum or potential. And these growth managers sometimes find these companies in emerging industries and they try to pick the quality companies early. Now, some characteristics of uh, growth type companies include a high price to earnings ratio. That's because typically they don't have um, too much earnings and you're sort of buying into that potential that this company will grow. Um, they also have high price to book ratio and a high price to cash flow ratio um, typically. Now the risks for growth companies, they're highly vulnerable to market cycles since they aren't already established. And also, if the earnings per share falters, it can cause a large percentage price decrease. Now, value managers, on the other hand, are um, another way to sort of evaluate stocks um, based on an active management style. It's actually the style that Warren Buffett has used throughout his career. And this style focuses on stocks that are perceived to be trading for less than their true value or their intrinsic value. And value managers, they seek stocks that are overlooked, disliked, or out of favor with individual or institutional investors. Now, in my opinion, I would say, for example, a lot of stocks in the oil industry, they might be considered um, value stocks now since a lot of them are overlooked and they're disliked. They're definitely out of favor now that electric cars seems to be a trend that is coming in. But these oil companies, they still are making a lot of money, especially, especially with oil priced so high. So I would say that... Um, 
Right now, if you are a value manager, you might want to look towards oil um, since they are being overlooked um, and they are still getting a lot of value um, and obviously are priced quite low, uh, even though they are making lots of money. Now, some characteristics of value type securities, um, they tend to have low price to earnings ratio because these investors, they're paying less for the earnings that a company is bringing in. They also have a low price to book ratio and a low price to cash flow ratio. So obviously that just means that these stocks, they tend to be overvalued. Investors are paying less for um, the growth or the book value of a company, paying less for earnings of a company and whatnot. And the risk of um, value type companies they tend to have a lower standard deviation, so they don't uh, tend to fluctuate as much um, since they tend to be uh, companies that are a bit larger. Also, stock price is tends to be already low, and it could also just remain low. Um, there's no guarantee that um, these companies will begin to be in favor again, and maybe they will start to our investors will start to realize the value that these companies have, um, but sometimes they really don't uh, realize that and they just stay low. Um, another risk is that they do have lower historical data, um, meaning that their stock price might be low um, for previous years as well. Now, another sort of equity manager style is the sector rotation style. Um, this is a top-down approach that focuses on analyzing the prospects for the overall economy. And they are not concerned with individual stock characteristics um, because their primary focus is to identify the current phase of the economic cycle. And the direction the economy is headed in and the various sectors will help them make the decision as to what stocks they want to purchase. Um, so we looked into it, uh, I believe, uh, in chapter 13, where we talked about um, sort of the uh, cyclical industry, the defensive industry, and of course the speculative industry. Um, so for example, if uh, a, a manager uses the sector rotation approach and they see that the economy is looking to be overvalued and maybe we do have a correction or um, a possible market crash, they might weight their portfolio overweight it into defensive um, industry stocks that way um, their portfolio will overperform compared to cyclical stocks and speculative uh, stocks and whatnot. Um, whereas if we're sort of recovering uh, at the end of a crash or at the end of a rec recession um, or correction and we're recovering, maybe they overweight the, uh, the cyclical type stocks. So industry selection, it is much more important than the individual stock selection using this approach. And the risk with this approach is that high volatility caused by the industry concentration, so um, just buying too much into one type or one industry, um, there's high volatility there because maybe you get it wrong um, and the rotation between the industries means that you are going to be buying and selling more often than some of the other strategies because, of course, the manager is trying to assess the economic cycle and they're trying to position their portfolio in a way to take advantage of that. Now, there are some fixed income manager styles. Um, they're quite straightforward. First off, you have term to maturity. Um, this is where investors or managers look at the uh, term. Our sh this is where investors or managers look to the maturity of a bond. Um, so basically, short-term managers, they hold T-bills or bonds with less than five years. You have medium-term managers focusing, focusing on uh, maturities of five to ten years. And then you have the long-term managers that focus on maturities of ten plus years. Uh, you have uh, fixed income managers that focus on credit quality. So uh, there's high-yield bonds or junk bonds um, that yield uh, higher uh return but they also do face greater credit risk um, so some managers focus on those there's also interest rate anticipators where managers feel they can add value by anticipating the direction of interest rates and structure their portfolios accordingly 
Um, an example of this is if uh, the manager thinks that, let's say interest rates are going to increase, then that would mean the price of these bonds will end up decreasing. They'll want to get out of their long-term bonds and buy short-term bonds because then when the short-term bonds expire, they can buy the longer-term bonds for a lower price. And so basically that is everything from chapter 15, at least all of the most important concepts. Um, so I really hope you did enjoy the video and learn something from it. Of course, stay tuned for chapter 16, which will be coming soon.